respiratory, get this done. We have the breaking up into three parts. One is really just the airway anatomy. So it's like the tubes that get the oxygen to the alveoli so we can exchange it, which is gonna be part two, where this sort of, that's part three. So the airway anatomy, sorry, is the tubes getting the air down into the alveoli. Part two is gonna be overall structure of the lungs, that basic anatomy, and then how we breathe. And then three is gonna be actually what we're gonna do with the oxygen, get it loaded onto the blood, get carbon dioxide released from the blood and so on. That's where the actual exchange is gonna take place. So for airway anatomy, you should know the regions and the functions. So let's start with air coming in. We'll talk about the nose. What is a unique feature of the nose and what is the purpose of that feature? Nasal concha, we have three of them, superior, middle, and inferior. What do nasal concha do? Create air turbulence, excellent. So we wanna create turbulence. When we create turbulence, we slow the velocity of air coming in down, and we wanna slow it down so it hangs out in our nose for a little bit. For what three purposes? We wanna warm it or equilibrate it to our body temperature, if you wanna call it be more technical, then what? What? Oh, moisten, yeah, humidify. Um, humidify and then filter. Filter it um, with any of the mucus and the hair in there. So then it goes from the nasal cavity into the nasopharynx. Then it drops down to the oropharynx. And then it drops down to the laryngopharynx. And that point, it's going to go, if the epiglottis is open, into the larynx. Inside the larynx is where we house our vocal folds. We have the cartilage structures that are located within there. So we have the, obviously, the epiglottis flap. We have the thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage on the back of that. We have the retinoid cartilages with the corniculate sitting on top. I'm trying to think of um, back up in the pharynx is where we have a lot of the, all of our tonsils which is our immune system guardian of any incoming hair, air, not hair, any incoming air to our body um, to protect ourselves from any potential antigens. Um, we go down from the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage to the trachea. The lining of the trachea is made of pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelial cells. We have mucus embedded within there. So the cilia and the mucus will trap additional airborne debris that made it past your nose, brings it up to the back of our throat. Obviously, either we expel it out or we end up swallowing it. So that's what's going on the trachea. The trachea branches off into the right and left primary bronchus. The right primary bronchus is gonna be a little straighter and pointing downward more. So if something were to get to make it past the larynx, um, it's more often not than trapped on the right side than it would be on the left. Um, every division of bronchioles beyond that is named for each division. So once you have the primary, then you had secondary, and it goes on from there until you finally go out to the terminal bronchioles where on the histology, you start to lose smooth muscle and you lose some of the cart hyaline cartilage that's helping to keep that airway propped open. The ends where you end up at the alveoli. The alveoli has the simple or is made of simple squamous epithelial tissue. It's flat and ideal for diffusion. So oxygen that's in the alveoli can move out easily to the blood. Carbon dioxide from the blood can move easily back into the alveoli to get be gotten rid of from the body. Then we also have surfactant cells which create surfactant with type, type two cells which create surfactant which help reduce surface tension so it prevents our alveoli from collapsing in on itself due to the water vapor. Back up to the vocal cord anatomy and muscles. You should know the vocal cord, it, cords, plural, are within the thyroid cartilage. They are attached in the front to the thyroid cartilage on the back, the movable side is the retinoid cartilages. And so the muscles of, um, of our speaking is actually attached to the back side moving um, 
the, our vocal folds together, pull tighter, looser, and whatnot. So lung anatomy, breathe in here, structure and histology of bronchioles. So the bronchioles, we have the lining is going to be pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Beyond that, another important feature is the hyaline cartilage. It's C-shaped, so it doesn't go all the way around. It goes about three quarters of the way, for or most of it. And then we have smooth muscle. The areas that there's a lot of hyaline cartilage, the smooth muscle doesn't do much. So as the hyaline cartilage starts to go away, the smaller and smaller the bronchioles are, you end up with a little more smooth muscle dominated areas. Those are the areas that are affected by asthma because asthma is when you have the smooth muscle contracting and it's actually gonna constrict the airway slightly. And it can do that more effectively or more easily and have a greater impact on people um, when the hyaline cartilage is absent because the hyaline cartilage kind of prevents that the airway diameter from changing too much. Then, let's see, surfactant production. We talked about surfactant already. I jumped ahead. Um, so surfactant production prevents collapse of the alveoli. It's a concern only in babies that are born a couple weeks early because they often don't have enough surfactant that's known as respiratory distress syndrome for those babies. So they're given an aerosolized version of surfactant so their lungs don't collapse. The pleura is the connective tissue serous membrane around the lungs. We have the parietal pleura that's touching the inside of the chest wall. And then we have the visceral pleura which is on the surface of the lungs themselves. The relationship of the parietal to the visceral, there's a fluid between, so it slides against each other very, very easily. But because they're essentially stuck together, when the muscles of our chest wall lift our chest wall up and out, the visceral pleura, which is attached to the surface of the lungs, which is also attached to the parietal pleura on the inside of our chest wall and our diaphragm, when the diaphragm goes down, it's pulling the whole lung downward too because of that relationship. When the chest wall pulls out, it's pulling the lungs outward too. So we breathe by contracting our muscles, first our um, diaphragm going down and our external intercostals lifting our chest upward. If we wanna take a bigger breath, we'll add in the scalenes, sternocleidomastoid and pectoralis minor as well. Um, if we wanna breathe out, the diaphragm just relaxes but if we really want to force air out, we're going to bend over, we're going to contract our abdominal muscles, and then we have our internal intercostal muscles inside, pulling that chest wall down. The lung volumes and capacities, you should be prepared to see a spirogram graph. You should be prepared to know the volume amounts for each of these, whether it's a tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, residual volume, or some capacities, which would be inspiratory capacity, that's your how much you can breathe in, plus the inspiratory reserve together, or your functional residual capacity, it's your expiratory reserve volume and your residual volume. The most important one is after you maximally inhale, you fill up your lungs as much as you can. From that point, your maximal exhale that you breathe out and let as much air out till you can't let any more out, that volume of um, air is known as vital capacity. So you should know about that one. That's about 4,500 milliliters. Factors that are affecting gas diffusion across membranes, that would be partial pressure difference. So you have a whole lot of molecules in the alveoli of oxygen, less in the blood. So that partial pressure difference is gonna drive the oxygen out of the alveoli onto the blood. The other factors are going to be membrane thickness. You want a nice thin membrane. A thick membrane is going to impair oxygenation. Then we have surface area. You want as many alveoli spaces interfacing with blood as you can possibly get so we can be more effective at our exchange. Then last but not least would be ventilation perfusion distribution, which also leads us into the zones of the lungs. But zone one, we have a lot of air. Lot less blood. So whatever blood makes it to zone one is going to get 100% oxygenated. Zone two is going to be the ideal. It's pretty much well matched for air and blood. It kind of comes in these pulsatile surges. Zone three 
we tend to have a lot more blood than the air that gets there can oxygenate. So we don't ever get 100% oxygenated from zone three. So collectively from the lungs, when we have the oxygenated blood leaving the lungs, it will be about 97%. We never get it to 100% because of the zone distribution known as ventilation perfusion mismatch. So we talk, just talked about the factors that determine gas exchange. So again, partial pressure difference, membrane thickness, surface area, and ventilation and perfusion matching. You should know basic oxygen partial pressures. In the alveoli, and we're all talking about sea level here, in the alveoli, it would be 104 millimeters of mercury. An arterial blood oxygen level would be, say, 100 millimeters of mercury, and that's different than 100%. That's about 97%. So it's 100 millimeters of mercury, and then a venous would be pretty much anything below 80, if you really want to think about, or 60 or below, ideally, probably is more. But more so you have a ballpark. So if you say somebody has an arterial you know, value, partial pressure of oxygen at 50 millimeters of mercury, then you immediately go, oh, it's going to be in a vein. You would just kind of have an idea where they are. So that's the only, you have alveoli, artery, vein, just these basic ballparks. Um, car oxygen and carbon dioxide transport. Oxygen is transported primarily bound to red blood cells in hem by hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide is primarily transported as carbonic acid in the plasma. What are factors that are going to affect oxygen and hemoglobin binding and unbinding? I find it easier to think of a hot, sweaty, burning energy muscle so if you want to think increase in temperature is going to help oxygen hemoglobin unbind. If you have acidity, the presence of acid, we've learned the carbon dioxide when it's released from the cells combines with water to become carbonic acid. That by itself helps oxygen unbind from red blood cells. If you're really exercising and you're making lactic acid, you just create even more acid. That's gonna help unload even more oxygen because your cells clearly need it. Um, so if you think of increase in temperature and decrease in pH is gonna help the unbinding. And therefore warmer or cooler temperatures and more alkaline is gonna help facilitate binding. Fetal hemoglobin is slightly different than postnatal hemoglobin in that it binds the term is known as a higher affinity for oxygen. It's going to bind more avidly to oxygen because it's trying to extract more from mom, the fetus is. The central nervous system control of respiration. I make this a special line item because I want you to realize that it is carbon dioxide also converted as a low pH is what's really the trigger for the pons and medulla in the central nervous system where it's oxygen that's really affecting the peripheral chemoreceptors in the um, baroreceptor, or sorry, in the carotid sinus and in the aortic arch. The terminology for oxygen and carbon dioxide, you have hypercapnia, that means a high level of carbon dioxide, hypocapnia, low carbon dioxide. We get hypercapnic if we breathe too slow kind of like holding our breath more. We get hypocapnic if we hyperventilate and like panting because rapid shallow breaths breathes off. And those, because the carbon dioxide is what's affecting our brain, have a greater impact on control of our diaphragm and our muscles of breathing. Um, so chemoreceptor locations and chemicals detected, that's really back to central nervous system, pons medulla, detecting carbon dioxide or low pH. Peripherally, aortic arch and carotid sinus is primarily gonna detect or respond to oxygen.